Um, welcome into the show. That GD show once again is Genevieve and say hello, Pastor Stan Mitchell. Am I supposed to say hi? Yes. Good yeah. job. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, tonight, oh, uh, Greg Markowski, thank you for that super chat. I see that already. He said it's the highlight of his week, Genevieve. Um, tonight's a little bit of a different show, and you'll know why in a minute. Um, uh, before we get into the content of the show and the conversation tonight, we want to have this special announcement and dedication. Go ahead, Correa. So, um, Genevieve, because I can't talk right now, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, tell our viewers who Milo Winslow is and why we're dedicating the show to him tonight. Um, oh gosh, I can't, I can't talk either. Um, Milo Winslow was an activist, a trans man in Lincoln, Nebraska, who fought every day for the rights for people like him and others in the queer community to just exist. Um, he did fantastic work and did his work with so much love, but when you are surrounded by a community that makes you feel alone and makes you feel like you are less than human, and when they celebrate doing so, it can be too much. And so last Thursday, we lost him to suicide. So... In his honor, we are dedicating the conversation of the show, which happens to be very on topic, um, to his memory. And I encourage everybody who is in Nebraska, everybody who is in Texas and Florida and everywhere in the country to stand up and take this torch from Milo and, and do your best and take care of yourself. Yeah, uh, this is... This is a tough one, um, dealing with this kind of thing, and and uh, gonna we're gonna talk to Stan here a minute. Uh, you'll know why this is actually the perfect show to um, talk about this. And Stan, uh, your mic is picking up a lot of movement, a lot of background noise there. I don't know what it is, but um, I think it's just scratching your sweater. If scratching it's something. On, yeah. something I wonder. There. I wonder how it sounds without it. Well, you're probably yep. going to get feedback. I don't know. How's, does it sound okay on you guys in? So there's not yeah. no scratching and everything. Yeah, that, may, that probably was it. It was it was yeah. scratching your move. You were moving. Yeah, so that's probably oh, better. Yeah. This, is high, this this was three dollars. <laughs> we get what you pay for. Yeah. Um, so uh, we're going to talk about a lot of of uh, these kind of issues that led to Milo taking his own life and. And the uh, the activism that he was involved, and I hope I got his pronouns right. I didn't check Genevieve. Mm -hmm. Is it he him? Yes. I'm sorry if I didn't get that right. Um, but Stan, you and I go way back. Actually, um, we have a similar background in that um, you were from a, I think, United Pentecostal background. That's right. Very fundamentalist, um, spirit filled, tongue talking, faith healing background. I was more um, broad stream, 
charismatic evangelical, but we we believe a lot of the same doctrinal points. And um, I just want to give a little background to the viewers as to our connection and how we got to know each other. Um, I stands in Nashville or Franklin, and I'm from Nashville, as many of you know. And back when I was deconstructing in my faith journey, back in uh, that, that started with me in 2010, 2011. Um, Stan and I got connected through mutual friends and, um, we learned of each other. I kind of, we kind of knew of each other when I was a pastor in the area and he was too. I knew who he was. Um, he probably didn't know who I was, but I knew who he was cause he was a big deal and still is. Um, um, but Bart Norman doesn't know who I am. So I'm not a big deal. I just learned that last night. I, I haven't gotten over it yet, uh, <laughs> but, um, Stan and I started getting together and uh, having these conversations. Uh, we started meeting for coffee and I started coming to his church uh, as an atheist. I was, I was already out as an atheist. I had completely left my faith and identified it as an agnostic atheist. But Stan was, was doing some things with his church that I was very interested in supporting. And it was, it was all about inclusion. And I'll let him tell a little bit more of that. Because uh, he can tell it better because it's his church. But I, I learned about that. And, and I just wanted to meet these people. And I wanted to support the work that you were doing, Stan, and the, and the transition that you were going through with your church and that you were going through personally. And as you went through it personally, you took your church through it to start including the LGBTQ community in ways that other churches pretty much just gave lip service to, if I'm probably saying that correctly. You you took it way further than, than most. And a lot of your church members just were not comfortable with that. You lost a lot of people. But I started coming and hanging out and just watching the service from afar. I would <laughs> I would loiter in the back like a coyote at a campsite. And uh, and I would sit outside on the patio and get to know some of the people and converse with them and just fell in love with them. Um, but I mostly was there just to support what you were doing, Stan, because I really felt like it was really important. And things like today, what well, didn't was it today? But I learned of it today. Drive home to me how important what you've been doing is in the, in the gay and trans community. So um, if you could just kind of take that handoff, Stan, and, and just kind of share your side of our connection and what you were going through as a church at Grace Point back in probably 2014, maybe 2015 when we met. Yeah, we, we started in 2012. But if you back up, Grace Point started in 2003. You and I both come out of the same, as you said, the same evangelical Pentecostal world. And I had already deconstructed to the point um, I, I referred to myself as a reverend Christian agnostic, you know, this, the, the sense that everyone to some degree is an agnostic with different levels of conviction about these things. Um, nobody knows, nobody knows there is a God, nobody knows there's not a God, but I <clears throat> started Grace Point with a group of friends to be a deconstruction zone for evangelicals. It really felt like, uh, again, a nod to appropriation as a cisgender, heterosexual white man. But back in those days, I really did feel like Grace Point was a bit of a Harriet Tubman-esque underground railroad for people coming out of traditional fear-based religion. We, we looked, we acted in a lot of ways like normal church, but it was a safe place for people to come and to fall apart and to not have to believe anything. A lot of people don't make the jump away from fear-based religion to either no religion or no God. They don't make that uh, in one large leap. They do it in gradients. And so because on matters of conscience, the fear-based stuff is so inculcated in people at such a you know cellular level that you normally can't leave that immediately. You can't get away. So you have to do it an inch at a time. And that was Grace Point. So that we did that. When we did that, we were a gadfly in the community. We were seen as, you know, the liberal progressive because we didn't have to believe anything. We just had to be a safe place for people to, what's the old um, Merle Haggard song, looking for a place to fall apart. That was kind of our theme song. 
And then in 2000, so I left it like that. And for 10 years, we grew to a few thousand people. And it was just that. When people would say, how do you feel about abortion or substitutionary penal atonement? I would say, are you asking me or are you asking about the church? People say, well, how's Grace Point feel about it? That's, I, my pat answer was, I don't know. You'll have to ask them. It's not a 501c3. Primarily in my mind, it's 2,500 to 3,000 people have different opinions. And, mm-hmm. and I left it like that. And I was already definitively liberal in my mind. If you to get in my mind where I was, I, I believe that I was either helping my branch of theism evolve to a better place or I was doing palliative hospice care for a religion that needed to die. And I couldn't I, I wasn't sure which of which, but I thought either was noble work. Mm-hmm. Um, and either needs religion writ large either needs to grow out of a fear-based judgment idea of God or it needs to go away. And of course, you guys have already jumped to that going away stage. You know, I remember years ago, I said to you, I said, Dave, the worst idea known to man is a fear-based view of God. You said, well, I can take care of that for you. <laughs> That's right. Let, let it go, Stan. Let it go. Yeah. You, you were like, no, the worst ideology is a view of God. Period. And if you don't have a view of God, then you don't have to wrestle with the possibility of having a bad God. So 2012, the Marriage Amendment Act came out. Now, all of a sudden, I had a pastoral ethical issue. I couldn't just keep being this deconstruction zone that was nebulous, that didn't take a stand, because now we had lots of gay people that were like, you're our pastor, would like you to marry us. Mm-hmm. So at that point, we entered into a period of discernment. And that whole deconstruction thing got conscripted. It it was overtaken by the LGBTQ thing. But the LGBTQ thing being, you know, a dominant civil rights issue of our day really gave us a place to kind of practically flesh out kind of the esoteric stuff we were all sitting around pontificating and navel gazing about. So well how did the how did it become um focused on the LGBTQ how, how did that become a focal point for you as you guys were going through? Well, you one of our one of our country music stars. You know, you pastor in Nashville. Everybody's got two or three in their church, and we had uh, a few big ones. And one of them was being interviewed in 2012 by the BBC, and she famously, at least in our little world, said that her church was uh, gay friendly. That was the it was the poor credentials she gave, gay friendly, whatever that means. We're friendly to gay people. It's like, a, okay, we get a bozo button. My, my perspective is I don't even like using words like inclusive, affirming. All of that is so self-congratulatory and patronizing and condescending. It's like, no, we, to use a religious word, we repented. What yeah. we did at Grace Point um, you know, I pretty much right out of the shoot told everybody we're not doing something magnanimous and wonderful. Queer people don't need us to do something great. They need us to stop doing something awful. That's all. If we get any awards, it's for just stopping our awfulness. So when she said that Westboro Baptist decided to come picket us, then we knew we were on the map. If we got Westboro Baptist holding signs out and they, they did that that weekend. Well, in my mind, I was already fully inclusive and it gave me a chance then to go to the church and say, let's take this journey. So we took a couple of years, period of discernment, wrestle with it. Then I finally married our friends, Michael and Josh, who was my first minister of music. I don't know if you know this, but there's a lot of LGBTQ people closeted in the Christian music industry. Mm -hmm. One of them was our guy, Michael Popham. And he had to leave Grace Point because he came out went through a divorce in his heterosexual marriage, um, left the church and oh, it was a big scandal in the beginning. And uh, anyway, he ended up being my first wedding 10 years later. So that's, that's the thumbnail sketch of how we jumped into it. Yeah. And I was kind of a uh, um, viewer. I, I began, I began to get interested in watching that happen as an atheist. Cause I found it fascinating And um, I'm still friends with many of your people there, even though I don't live there. I still connect with them uh, through the the beauty of the Internet. Um, But Stan, something I mean, I I think what we want to jump. By the way, folks, we we do not have our call in studio tonight. We've got some production challenges tonight. Uh, Correa 
Courageous has has uh, jumped in to substitute for Ethan tonight because he's transitioning. So any questions you have for Stan, me, or Genevieve, comments, please put them in the chat. We will be looking for them, and we will we'll we'll jump on there and ask those questions. I think you're going to want as we delve into this a little more. You're going to want to have you're going to have some questions for Stan because he's been doing some amazing work. Um, I, I just, you know, Santa, you and I, we had those conversations, like you said. Um, yeah, we're going to get to that. I got cookies. Thank you for that super chat. What did Stan think of conversion therapy when he was evangelical? Sit on that a minute, Stan. I want to, I want to get that from you. I know what you think of it now. You're muted. Hang on. You're muted. Oh, um, well, who muted me? Well, they're muting you when you're not talking because you I get a lot of feedback. Well, now you can talk. <laughs> Is, is there yeah. feedback? Is there feedback on my end? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, you, you, you might just want to mute yourself when you're not talking, and then when you do want to speak again, that's a good just idea. Hit that button. Hey, when I'm speaking, is there feedback? No, no, when you're speaking, it's fine. It's just when your I think it's when our audio comes through your headphones, it's picked that's up on your is. mic again, and so then it's just like a little offset, <laughs> garbly. But uh, the, the, <laughs> it's tough. So what were joke. you saying about that? Yeah. Uh, I was just saying that the question about conversion therapy, you told me to sit on it. And I said, that's a reasonable place for it to be. Well, go ahead and answer it. As you, when you were um, an evangelical pastor, um, I know I was conflicted as in that world with the whole gay question and what to do with that. Cause I, I had compassion for the individuals, but I was conflicted because my theology told me something different and I really didn't know what to do with it. So, did you ever wrestle with the conversion therapy issue among uh, with with the gay folks? Of course, we didn't think there was anything wrong with the idea of conversion. Our whole world name was about conversion. We were converting Muslims and Buddhists. Shoot, where I came from, we were converting Baptists and Methodists. It was and all Catholics. About yeah, yeah. So when you have that idea of an angry God that you know everybody has to get everything exactly right, then you're always looking for the wrong things to convert people on, and of course. Sexuality was certainly one of those biggies in our world. And yeah, we, we didn't view conversion therapy as heinous. We viewed it as a gift to people. We were helping them come out of sin, right? I mean, that's just to fix their brokenness, right? Yeah, we were fixing their, but we were doing them a favor. We weren't hurting them. And, you know, I, I was telling you guys before, just thinking about Milo and the heartbreak of all that. I mean, now, you know, that's the world that I live in. I, I just work as a pastor at large to, you know, these folk that are coming, coming out. Hang on. That's my dog having a fit. Your dog. Yeah. Oh, Go good. Ahead. It's on your end. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. So anyway, what, what did you tell us backstage Stan about the funerals you've done recently? I in was the just past 15, 14 months. Milo today. I was just thinking about the last, few months i've done 15 funerals in the last 14 months more than one a month for queer folk um, that have lost their life to suicide and of the 15 the strong implications were religious their their angst their sorrow was driven by a sense of just unwarranted shame that was created by religion an angry god that they could not make peace with I just don't have words. Yeah. I don't either. It's what I, it's what, what I do all day, every day now. You know, Dave, that I, at Grace Point, I'm still the founding pastor, but I moved on from the everyday operation of the church. We have a wonderful new lead pastor there now. My entire life now is spent being a, what, what did I call it earlier? A pastor at large to queer people. Um, who live in small towns in North Dakota and Delaware and Idaho and Nevada and Nebraska and, and Nebraska, and they're from Southern Baptist Assembly of God, Church of Christ, Nazarene, Methodist backgrounds, and they have a 14 year old kid that just came out, or you know, some variation of that, and they can't go back to their church, they don't know what to do, they don't know how to reconcile this. So, my entire life is just devoted to these folk. Um, I probably spend four to six hours a day on FaceTime, Zoom with these people just at the intersection of gender, sexuality, and 
faith. These are people who are not ready to let go of the idea of God. These are people who it won't let go of them. They're traumatized. They're afraid. They want to reconcile it. You know, th their entire life, they were just playing with plastic chips and Monopoly money. But now all of a sudden, every dime they have in the world lying on the table in the beating heart of their child and the game all of a sudden is a lot more serious. And so I work with those folk. That's my life. I, I've known that. And I've seen every now and then you post um, on Facebook uh, conversations. Go ahead and mute Stan for a second. Um, every now and then you post on these conversations you're having with uh, a lot of times the parents um, oftentimes you, you share conversations you have with folks that from your former faith who are coming at you a, in judgment for what you're doing, that you're straying from the faith, you're straying from God's written word, you're straying from the orthodox theology that you know is true. And, and, and you've been very, I, I like the transparency that you have with that because you share your interactions with them and and how you're trying to help them come to understand God in a different way, uh, that he's not angry and vindictive and judgmental, but they're clinging to their uh, notions of an angry God. As you and I've said before, I think it's better if we just let go of the concept of God altogether. But fair enough, you you deal with people who aren't ready to do that and and for whatever reasons may not ever be ready to do that. And I think it's, I think it's wonderful that you meet them where they are. Now we have people who watch this show that really don't, don't have tolerance for progressive Christians as we call them. And Genevieve and I have had this conversation before, whether we, you know, what we think about it here and there. Yeah, it's hard. I mean, I know I keep going back and forth and back and forth. And I think that Stan, you said it so beautifully when you're talking about, you know, are you just performing palliative care for a religion that has to die? I, I never know what the right answer is because I do have friends that are Christians and I can respect how important these beliefs and communities are to them as individuals <laughs> But then, yeah, when I look at the, the religion at large and I look at all of the atrocities in the Bible, not just the homophobia, but the genocide and misogyny, um, the slavery, I, I keep wondering, is it worth hanging on to the Bible if we're going to kind of brush aside those things when really it seems much more simple to say, None of this has any relative, like is not relative, relevant, sorry, to our lives anymore and is causing harm. And my big fear, even, you know, with, with the Christians who, who are progressive, um, are they just, is seeing another church, regardless of what the belief is, just making that, you know, religious right who believes that this is a Christian nation and that every, like, to be an American is to be a Christian, is it just sort of like adding cannon fodder um, and, you know, inflating their army, if you will? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's, Dave and I've had this question, or we've had this conversation a lot, you know, am I trying to redeem something that's irredeemable? Mm-hmm. Am I trying to polish a, you know, a cow pile here and shellac it and, and just make something nice out of something that can't be nice? Here, here's the reality from, from my perspective. I feel like I work at the intersection of two wounds. The, the wound on the LGBTQ side is very obvious. The religious wound there is severe and it's deep. But I carry also... Uh, as a cisgender heterosexual person that comes from a highly fundamentalist, highly fear-based, exclusivistic religion, I deal with my own inner wounds. Um, mm -hmm. As a child, I grew up biting my fingernail to the quick. I grew up with a spastic colon. I grew up five and six years old, horrified every time I couldn't find my mom in the house that the rapture had taken place and that I was going to be left behind. The reality is, I do think a, a fear-based religion creates an unnecessary fear that once it's created, I, I don't know, I, I don't know that, I think there are a lot of people who never get over it. 
that there is always because the strength of fear based religion is really an insurance algorithm. It's all based on a what if. I mean, the, the reality is, if you told me there was an 80 percent chance tomorrow that based on my schedule, I was going to get a cold and it was going to last a couple of days, just have sniffles. I wouldn't change my schedule. If you told me. If you told me tomorrow I had a five percent chance of contracting pancreatic cancer or Dave ALS based on my based upon my routine, I would change everything because a 5% chance of something that severe is huge. The reality is Christianity, the, the whole point of an insurance algorithm is you pay a reasonable, affordable fee to avoid the possible catastrophic. And you cannot come up with something more catastrophic than living forever in the worst torture with your family. And honest to God, guys, if I thought there was a 1% chance that that was true, I think I'd still be enough of a chicken shit to do everything. I mean, a 1% chance of burning. But you know it's not. You know it's bullshit. So you and I, Dave, we're not, we're not going to pay $3 a month for that kind of insurance. Mm -hmm. I, for me, it's an ethical issue of I'm not going to buy flood insurance if I live on the top of Mount Everest. And if you live in Des Moines, there's no need to have tsunami insurance, right? You just shouldn't. But the folk I'm dealing with coming from the world, Dave, that you and I came from, some of it's personality driven. There are a lot of those folk that have never gotten over the what if. I deal every day with dozens and dozens, hundreds of queer people who are their own worst enemy on this because just about the time they get over the hump, they wake up at three o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. in cold sweats thinking, but what if? Because the reality is the purveyors of the fear-based stuff, all they got to do is convince their audience that there's a 1% chance. And their audience is looking to me saying, can you guarantee me? So it's really a mind, you know what? I'm trying to watch my language because I know y'all don't use bad language on this oh, show. Oh, you can totally swear. Oh, I don't fucking do. You know, he was being facetious. You he are knows, being facetious. He I'm knows sorry. me. He knows I'm me tired. really well. Anyway, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm not going to catch that, up. That's where I'm coming from. I... Before I before I ever had a heart for queer people, I had a heart for people coming out of fear-based religion, and I, I wanted to help them. And man, there are a lot of them that come out so slowly because they are scared shitless, mm -hmm. and it, it's, it's a really powerful, powerful wound that these people carry. And so the LGBTQ community just doubles that wound so i not only have a sympathy and and a, and a heart for queer people who've been abused by these corrosive evil ideas about god i also have always maintained a heart for those who are still as i see them sincerely caught in that same world and you know why i know that because i was there Mm -hmm. when, people, when, when people say to me, well, we, you know, Christian people just need to love gay people. That's not the point. I did. I didn't start loving gay people. I didn't change my mind about, I didn't change my heart about gay people. I changed my mind about scripture and God. Right. I, I didn't start loving them. I got rid of some really bad ideas, which again, we can talk all day long about, you know, do we just need to get rid of the idea of God altogether? Then you don't have to worry about the fear-based thing for the people I'm working with. Very few of them make the jump you guys have made. They might get there someday, but it goes in 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 graded stages. If that makes sense, we we probably should start working in tandem. You get them to the place where they let go of the fear based religion and come to terms with that, and then I'll take them all the way out the gate. <laughs> what if that's not what I want? And what if I don't want them to go all the way out of the gate because I well, have to go all the way out of the gate? Then I need to work on you. Um, <laughs> I'm going to do conversion on you. Let, let, that's what we need to do. Well, I see some of the comments and, and there are people I know. I know a lot of our audience. We've had these conversations before and a lot of them like this comment with Darren Wright isn't all religion fear based. Ultimately, um, Bill Castle, is he a clergy project? I don't think you're part of the clergy project. Are you Stan? Because you still believe in some sort of God of some kind. Um, but but that that whole concept of, you know, the religion that they're clinging to, is that is that helping them? Is it is it anything more than a security blanket in in, in your 
or even for yourself, Stan, I mean, maybe this is a question you still wrestle with. Cause you and I had to, I remember once we, we, we came to this place where, where we were sitting, I think at a Panera and, and I said something like, I, I think we, neither one of us know if there's a God or not. The difference between us is that I'm okay with that. And, and uh, you went just like you did this. Now you went, no, nah. <laughs> Uh, oh, I didn't turn my mic off. So here's the deal. I I am a sentimentalist. I'm a nostalgic. Uh, Frederick Buechner said it really well. Two thirds of all theology is autobiography. And there are personality types that certainly play into this. I am a nostalgic, sentimental person. I, I certainly don't know there's a God. Um, do I believe there's a God? Well, Believe. I mean, belief for me is, you know, anything between zero and, and 100, zero and 100 being certain. None of us have zero or 100. I always say we're all agnostic, some with theistic leanings, some with atheistic leanings, and yeah. some of us light up and down that scale, <laughs> you know, uh, at, at the same uh, in the same day. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I. I suppose I hope. I hope there's a God. I and and yet you and I've had that conversation, Dave. You, for almost the same moral reasons, hope there isn't. I I think a lot of it for me got bound up and intertwined in the afterlife. I'm so selfish and narcissistic. I I don't want to quit living. So I'm kind of hoping I will persist and go on. I, I want, I want there to be like a 1962 Mayberry show that Andy and Barney and I just keep living forever. But, okay. But, but let's, I mean, I know you kind of in jest there, but I, because of, because of my dying out loud work and we'll get to this comment from Vaglad agnostic. Thank you for your super chat. I'm going to, I want to talk about this in just a minute. Thank you for that. Um, and we'll come back to that, but because of the, the work I've done in the last couple of years and, and as someone with a terminal illness, I talk about death and dying a lot and I talk about the afterlife a lot or the lack thereof. And if, if you look at that idea as hoping that there's something there in my view, it makes what we have here less valuable because it doesn't have that finite quality that, that, I mean, it's like watching a movie that never ends or eating a meal that never ends. It, it's not as good if you if you really break it down, because when you know that that last bite is coming or that la that final credits are going to roll or that last note of this of the beautiful song is going to play, then you're you're savoring that all the more because it's finite. Okay. Not because, you but see the, what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I totally see what you're saying. My pushback is so if that's true. Does that mean we should wish away years in this life because the fewer years we have in this life, the better it is because we know that it's limited? I mean, what, no, I think it's I, don't, I think it's not I think it's not the number of years. It's the finiteness of them, knowing that there will come an end. And And so what I've talked about that that seems to resonate with folks is that because we because I've. I put it this way. We've all got a clock that, that we, we know our time is, is limited, but my clock's sitting out on my desk because I've been given this diagnosis. And so it causes me to savor the moments all the more because I'm much more aware that my end is, is closer than most everyone I talk to unless they are faced with an accident. Um, so, I think it's not the, the number of the years that we have or the number of the days that we have. It's the quality of those days. And the fact that we know that they're, they're going to run out someday, it makes it so much more valuable to me to make the most of what we do know we have. I'm, I'm wearing a shirt right now that says it's the, it's the last line of a poem that says we have two lives and the second one begins when you realize you only have one. It changes everything when you look at it from that perspective. But anyway, we could talk about that all day. And we have, you and I, for hours. Uh, vaguely ag agnostic says, I am Dave's age, gay, grew up secular, but went evangelical when they told me gay was a choice. 
Full gospel, Christianity messed me up. There was no support 40 years ago. I am rejoicing with your program today. That's for you, Stan. So rather than focus on the God, no God issue, um, I want us to get back to the work you're doing because it's immensely valuable. And and you are, are, are shepherding these people. I saw some questions. What is Stan a pastor of? Um, is he a pastor? Are you on Twitter? Some people want to get to know you better. Um, but you're shepherding people from very traumatic positions, whether it's religious based or their LGBTQ um, realities that they deal with. Um, what is it, Stan, that drives you to do this? Because I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you deal with these families day in and day out and bury these precious children who ran out of hope. How, how do you keep giving them hope? How do you keep having hope yourself for humanity, if you will, around, yeah. this, around this issue? Yeah, the, the reality is I, um, I, I, I get no relief moving away from this issue because burying my head in the sand, closing my eyes doesn't change the reality of what these folk are going through. And I suppose for whatever reason, I just was, you know, we would call it on my end calling, but I, I was psychologically equipped, hard equipped to do this. Um, you know, and per per the blows that I take, I, I've said many, many times, if you call yourself an ally to a group of people, if you call yourself an advocate for a group of people, and you're not getting hit by the stones that are thrown at them, then you're not standing close enough. Mm, the reality good. is, you know, I, I, what, what I endure pales in comparison, um, you know, but I'm sitting here, Dave, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here at my mom and dad's house, beloved people. Um, I come over two days a week here to Arkansas. Mom has dementia and dad needs the help. I can do what I do wherever I have my phone or the computer. I can do it. So I come over here. You know, my dad and mom are precious people, still very much Pentecostal, evangelical people. I remember my dad not long ago with tears in his eyes looking at me saying, I, I, it would be better if you were gay, because at least if you were gay, God might have mercy on you because you deal with the temptation. Mm. But he said, son, with tears in his eyes, he said, son, the judgment of God is going to be so much stronger for you. Now, listen, I'm 53. I am capable at this point psychologically of being able to disappoint my parents and and live with that you know the great grief for me is the sorrow that the ideology causes them watching yeah. them grieve i mean my, my dad literally thought that mom's dementia was catalyzed by my decision to do this work that her brain threw a breaker and a, a switch so i get just a little taste in this world as an advocate of what my queer brothers and sisters are going through and for whatever reason, you know, that's broken my heart. And I, in 2019, I realized that I couldn't keep doing the day-to-day -day operation of the local church there at Grace Point. So we got a lead pastor to replace me. And here's what I started doing, just so everybody understands what I do. I, and I, I didn't, I didn't mean for this to happen, but one day someone mentioned to me that they were really grateful that I was a voice for the voiceless. And and I, I knew immediately that that was a, a, you know, they were they were meaning it intentionally, kindly, but it was really a, a ridiculously patronizing statement that I, you know, one more cisgender, heterosexual, white, middle-aged, evangelical guy, I'm a voice for the voiceless. The reality is queer people have as much of a voice as I've got. But I, so I, I began thinking about that. Well, I'm not a voice for the voiceless. They've got a voice, but I do have a lot of privilege. And how does my privilege play out? And, you know, when you're looking at majority privileges, you really have to wrestle with the question, do I reject these entirely or do I steward them? Do I somehow husband them and use them economically? And what I realized was I don't have a voice and they don't have a, or I, I don't have a voice that they don't have. What I have is a platform. Yeah. And I looked at these 20 or 30,000 people that were, you know, followers of mine on Facebook and I thought, Instead of me just doing one more, being one more stupid preacher out there arguing theology on in post and not changing anybody's mind, but just 
playing for cheap applause and everybody who already agrees with me, I thought, why don't I use this to tell their stories? Because I realized that it's stories that really move the needle. I mean, that's what got me. I pastored queer people who had in, incredible lives and incredible suffering. And it was their stories that finally broke me down and said, I, I can't keep doing this. Something's wrong. Something is terribly wrong. So what I started doing a couple of years ago, Dave, is I just started taking the stories of people like Milo and, and in life and posthumously just using that microphone, that platform, that amplification system I had, I just got out of the way and started telling their stories. Well, here's what happened. When I started writing, I spend two to four hours every day writing these stories, trying to congeal them, make them concise, pithy. When I put those stories, all of a sudden they started getting hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of clicks and likes and comments. But the real magic beyond the comment section, there was a lot of beauty in the comment section, but the real magic was every one of them would generate anywhere from three to 15 private messages mm -hmm. from some kid, you know, in Wyoming who had his, the gun out and was ready to do the deed and somehow clicked and came across me and read a story. And when I get those direct messages in my inbox, within 24 hours, I respond to them and say, I, I'm honored that you reached out to me. I know you can't go back to your little Assembly of God church. I know you haven't told your parents yet. I, I'm i here. Here's my phone number. Just that. Just And it's not like a form letter. You're not going to get a switchboard. This is my cell phone. You call it, which they normally respond. You're kidding. Is yeah. this yeah. who are you? I give them my phone number and within days um, I'm on a zoom call, face time call. I fly out to those places. I meet with the families, the, you know, the grandparents, the parents, the kids, and that's my day. That's all I do every day. I spend a few hours writing the post. I spend a couple of hours responding to the messages and I spend three to four hours with people um, wrestling through. Yeah. I know that. And I've seen uh, some of those messages you've shared with them with me. I've, I've seen the conversations you've had, the people you've interacted with. I think a lot of your work is trying to navigate between family members, correct? And trying to help them come to peace with each other. Would you, would you say that? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, again, this is the intersection of two wounds. We're, I, I don't approach moms and dads um, as, as angry as I get. And I, I, get, I get as angry as you do, maybe more so because I'm immersed in this every day. I have found that I have to channel my anger. I, I do maintain a sympathy for the perpetrator because I used to be that perpetrator. And I remember when I was the perpetrator, I was sincere. I don't approach these parents saying, if you motherfuckers would just love your children. I, d I don't do that. It doesn't work. No, no, I know. To approach a set of parents and accuse them right out of the chute of not loving their child, you can't do anything more offensive. Now, we can argue whether they're loving them effectively or not, but in theory, I do know these people care for their children. Because you most, were that person. Yes, most of the time, their problem, their problem is not a bad heart. Their problem is horrible ideas, horrible yeah. religion. And as much as I wish everybody could just get over it the way you did, people don't. Yeah. And for whatever reason, because I think it took me so long, because I was scared shitless the whole way, I just have a sympathy for that. So I'm able to work at the intersection of helping nurse these people along. And somehow, I, I suppose, because I was there, I've been able to maintain a patience. And you got to have patience in this. I don't have any patience for people who look at me and say, this issue does not deserve to be revisited. I personally believe it is a Christian ethic to revisit issues on the grounds of human suffering. I mean, we, we defended slavery for 19 centuries for crying out loud as a religion. And it was the suffering of a group of people that finally drove us back to say, my God, we got that wrong. Mm -hmm. um, we, you know, we, we've, we've gotten so many things wrong. So 
I don't have a lot of patience for people who say, you know, there's no reason to revisit this. I mean, really, the, su- the, the two suicide attempts of your 14 year old child that you describe as the best of your four children, those suicide attempts aren't enough to drive you back to revisit this. I don't have a lot of patience for that. Mm-hmm. I do have patience for the ones that are sincerely in the process, grinding and scared to death because they don't want to get it wrong because they're still held by those old ideas that used to have both of us. If that makes sense. Yeah, Genevieve, uh, yeah. speak to this. Uh, Jeffrey Riley, you saw that comment. Genevieve, help me with the comments. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, throw I, that throw that one out. Uh, the cognitive yeah, it's, a, it's right here. Wondered how Stan deals with the cognitive dissonance between his good deeds and the religion he is a part of. Um, I, I I'll hear your thoughts first, but I do also have sort of a disclaimer that I'll share afterwards uh, for everybody in the chat. I, I would love to hear your disclaimer first. I, I would too, Stan. <laughs> my disclaimer, as I said, I have gone back and forth on this so many times about whether or not progressive Christianity is just giving legitimacy to wildly toxic religions. And and personally, I think that, you know, in my life, I have no need for religion. I have no need for mythology and fairy tales to give me a purpose in life. But I recognize that some people do. And as, as, as wonderful as it would be for people to just find secular communities that are grounded in, in, in facts and to, you know, for all of that, that that's just not going to happen overnight. That's not, that's not realistic. And I still have evangelical friends, not just progressive Christian friends. I have friends that are Southern Baptists. And I understand that I speak to them very differently than I do to anybody else because, you know, my step in talking to them when they hand me something ridiculous like this, like, I'm not going to say, well, I'm an atheist and you should be too. I'm going to talk to them about scripture and sort of introduce them to a more progressive way of thinking because the the fact of the matter is i would much rather those friends go to a pastor like you um than leave their religion for the wrong reasons um or stay where they're at and in the context of what we're seeing with these laws that are passing in texas and florida and arkansas and all over the country and this ordinance in lincoln nebraska um this is a crisis and we don't have time to argue that Christianity is bad and it should just go away Mm -hmm. because there are queer Christians and they need a safe place to go. That's it. Because the world is not safe right now. So thank you for what you're doing. That's it in a nutshell. Yeah. The reality is you guys at least see me as remediation. I, I, I am, I'm at least providing a thoroughfare, a halfway house on the way out of the prison of Mm -hmm. religion. And um, you know, and it's plausible. I mean, it, for, for me, and, and I, I'm very clear about this with people. I, I, the, the best way that I see religion, I, the idea of salvific religion, the idea of a God that has to be appeased and we have to have someone who's a professional for a small phenomenal fee kind of deal as a mediator between us and this angry God, you know, that, that, that idea has, has got to go away. Religion as a wisdom tradition, religion as, you know, uh, um, you know, something uh, to, to look at the words of Jesus as an incredible sage who, who provided wisdom like the Buddha, like Confucius, you know, I, I do think there's still value in Native American spirituality. Uh, you know, I... In, in terms of the religion that I'm a part of and the dastardly things that have been done in the name of God in that religion, again, I don't know what else to say except to say there's something inside of me, whether that's nostalgia or reason, others can judge. There's something inside of me that says that Christianity has within it the seeds of its own reformation and it can mature to being a positive wisdom tradition that moves away from fear. I get hit from both sides because obviously conservative Christians feel like that is a horrific decimation. And I don't even deserve to use the word Christian when I'm, 
you know, labeling it that. Um, and then I get hit from the more progressive side that says I'm still trying to polish the turd and, you know, make something good out of something. I, I, I just have a sense. I have a sense that there might be something afoot in the universe. I don't have an expectation of an afterlife much more than Dave does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I, I'm very agnostic about all of that. I don't count on it. I don't plan on it. I would love for it to be the case, but all of my hopes won't make that so. So I don't, I don't bank on it. I don't count on it. If it happens, it will be a bonus. If there is a God, the one thing I know coming from a Pentecostal background and watching people stand on their head, trying to hear from that God and touch that God. And Dave, you remember all the machinations we went through? Oh, yeah. They weren't fake. They weren't quick. We weren't, we weren't a bunch of quacks. We were people sincerely trying to feel those goosebumps, to have some sense that God was with us, that we were OK in this world. I understand all of that. And yet looking back on all of that and my own experience of these 53 years. If there is a God, it, it seems quite clear to me that that God is not interactive with us on a micromanaging, intimate level. And if that God does exist, then I think the unwillingness to interact with us on that level is a gift because it gives us one another. It gives us this. I, I'm, my Christianity, Dave, is very incarnation, incarnational and humanistic because it, it does drive us to this and it leaves all the rest just to some sense of hope and mystery that I don't stay yeah. occupied with. And I think, I think, you know, I see the comments and there's, there's so many people that just really want to dismiss Christianity altogether. And I'm with you. I have no, I have no need for religion or Christianity or any of those labels, but I think if we were to, um, if we were to peel the layers back and look inside Stan, Mitchell, I think we would see not a, a, a Christian in any sense of the traditional term, because that comes with that comes with so much baggage for wh however you have identified it and, and from whatever place you came. But you're a, you're a human, you're a humanist. You you believe in the good of humanity. You believe in humans treating each other well. And you set about to do that yourself every single day at a and meeting people at a juncture of their greatest need, as you said before. Um, I just, I, and I, yeah, I see all the chats and I hear what you're saying, people, and I'm sometimes there with you too. But right now tonight, because as Genevieve so beautifully stated, we're in a fucking crisis here. And our young people are killing themselves because they can't be who they are because of, outdated, outmoded, ridiculously ignorant ideas that are propagated by their family members that are embedded within them, lodged in them with irrational fears. I'm like you, Stan. I've known people in my own life. I work with a group called Recovering from Religion. I need to make sure you, you have a good connection with them because I think they could help a lot of your people. They have great resources and well-trained counselors just to help people at whatever place they are with their deconstruction journey. And they're not trying to guide people out of faith. They're helping people navigate that journey. And um, but but I, I know people like you who wake up with night sweats with an irrational fear of hell that was lodged in them as children. And that's that's child abuse. And I know that you are against that on every level and that you are, as a human, just trying to meet people at the place of their need and guide them to a safer place. And, and Dave, the, the reality is I, I see all the comments. I, those are the same kind of comments that I get daily on my all the time. I know I, I live between these two worlds. And but what I want to say to all the people making the comments, great, in theory, fine. The people I'm working with, nine out of 10 aren't going to do it. You can scream, holler, cuss, tell them to quit believing it. They're not going to do it. But when I stop and take their hand I, and, and look at them and say, I believe God is better than this. 
that stretches most of the people I'm working with, that stretches them almost farther than they can go. Mm-hmm. It's getting them to revisit their interpretation of Romans 1. I'm not asking them not to take the Bible or Paul seriously. I'm not asking them not to believe in God. I'm telling them the God they believe in could be better. Even that stretches the bulk of them. So as frustrated and angry and ridiculous as all of this sounds, the problem is this is not a small group of people. This is hundreds of millions of people just in our religion who Mm -hmm. aren't going to read one book. They're they're not going to read Hitchens or Hawkins. They're not going to read Dawkins. They're not going to read one book and say, oh, oh. Well, shoot, if I'd known that, I'd read that book a long time ago. Well, uh, you know what? They might, if they read my, my memoir, give them my memoir. That might, that might change everything. Yeah, I bet it will. <laughs> Just kidding. You need yeah. to read it, though, Stan. I think you'll like it. I will. Um, Cause I like you. I like what you're saying. I, I, I just, it, it, it doesn't work that way. No, no. Let's do, this, let's do this question. Scott Clark, can you put that up, Correa? Yeah, very good question. Stan, uh, I want you to speak to this. How can I protect protect my trans son, 14, who still wants to go to our old evangelical church youth group? I'm afraid he may hear something from someone that may hurt. Speak to that. I personally don't know how you can protect your child when they're going into the very furnace of the worst fire. Um, I, I, I don't think you can protect them. I think I think the only way to protect them is to not allow them to go there. Now, the conundrum is I have a 16 year old and a 23 year old. So I know what it's like if if my 14 year old trans child is wanting to go to a place that is abusive, then I'm going to talk to them about Stockholm syndrome. I'm going to talk to them about why they want to subject themselves to the abuser. What's happening here psychologically? If they build a good solid case that they still have friends there that aren't doing this and they feel like they're going to be in there and they're going to put a different face on this. You know, I'm not saying that I wouldn't let them go because I know how hard it is to tell a teenager they can't do something. But I can't imagine allowing my child to keep going back to a place that tells them because of this beautiful part of their life that they are inherently flawed. That that feel that it's abuse. I don't know what else to say. And it would feel like. You're being complicit with the abuse to continue to let them be subjected to that. Yeah, but he's he's in a tough spot because, like you said, if he tells them to not do it, so it, you got to tread lightly, right? I just, I just said I got a teenager, and if she built a good case, I, I yeah. do know what it is to lose some battles to win the war. And if if they built a good case, but man, I would be having a serious conversation. Sounds like. You got a 14 year old who's a tough kid that might be able to handle it and stand up and every kid's different. Yeah. yeah. And, and you know, I might push back a little bit too. Um, Cause I do agree with what you're saying. That's, that's, that's pretty abusive to send a child to a place that is going to tell them that they're terrible, but you, you can't tell a teenager not to do something. And the other thing too, is that, the world is full of hatred and bigotry. And as much as we want to protect our children from that, we need to remember that our children will not be children forever. You're raising an adult. And so perhaps this could be a good time to have that conversation about why do you want to go back? Are you aware of some of the things that you might hear? And, and also let them know, empower them to say, regardless of what they say in that church, if at any moment anybody makes you feel like you're not loved by God or worthy or what have you, you, the problem is not you. The problem is them. And we're getting the fuck out of here. So I don't know. I think think there is a difference between this child taking the initiative and saying, I get what they're saying. I get what they're doing. My friends are there. I want to go. That's different than the parents dragging a child to a place where the child's being abused and not wanting to be there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And and Correa even just said in the in the chat, if you take him, go to church with him. Yeah, absolutely. That would be chaperoned. That, you know, I would not send my 14-year-old trans child into an evangelical church and not sit right by their side to punch anybody in the face if they tried anything. So I I think that that is a great idea too. So Stan, these I'm I'm coming back to these these funerals you've done in the past year. 
and um, no doubt will do more, um, unfortunately. I have to imagine that many of the times you're dealing with parents who are just crushed because they treated this in the wrong way or didn't treat it. They feel guilty and complicit in some way. How, how do you, have, have you dealt with that and how do you deal with that? I, I receive letters at least a couple of months, at least a, uh, some of the most compelling, heartbreaking letters that I receive are from parents 30 and 40 years on the other side of the death of their child, still reeling and roiling in their <sighs> grief that they were partying. And there's nothing I can say to let them off the hook. They'll never be off of the hook. They know that they drove their child away. They know that they supplied much of the emotional rope that that child used mm -hmm. uh, in the end of their life. And it's really, really heartbreaking. I do know a few of those. I have at least a half a dozen of those moms and dads that the most semi sense of redeeming that horror is that um, they allow me to use their story. Mm -hmm. And at times when I am in the middle of it with a family and the family says, I just wish I had, you know, another family who's been through this to talk to. These are families that I use. Yeah. Uh, and it's a, it's a profound, it's a profound testimony they have of my God, whatever you do, don't do what we did to our child because we never get another chance. Let me ask you this. Do yeah. you ever put these parents together? All the time. Okay. All the time. That's yep. good. Yeah, that's, I, I literally, I feel like a traffic cop at an intersection, this gracious intersection of all these lives. And almost every day, I'm saying, I got somebody who would be great for you to talk to. And um, it's, it's very redeeming, even for the ones that, you know, feel like they're somehow being able to use the pain that they've had. Um, mm -hmm. Mixed orient right now, I'm dealing with a couple of families in mixed orientation marriages. I mean, there are so many 45-year-old men and women who finally are at Erickson's stage of generativity and they know they have less time left than they've lived. And all of a sudden they're deconstructing. One of the things they're deconstructing is that they're gay, but they've lived a heterosexual life, but they got three kids, two grandkids, a mortgage and a partner who often is their best friend in the world. And now they're coming out. What do you do with that? I, right now I'm dealing with two families in the throes of that. Both of them have teenagers and I have several people that have already gone through that, landed in different places, and I'm able to put them together. So, yeah, there's a lot of that. There, There is beauty in the ashes here. I, I do hear stories like that. And, and just last week, um, we were at a – we had a beach week. And, um, Genevieve, I don't think you got to meet uh, Samantha. No. She'd already, she'd already left, but you probably heard of her because she was so fucking amazing. Um, but a, a follower, I, I know, I don't know if you're watching right now, but you will watch later. I know Samantha, but, um, transgender woman from Maine, we had a beach week with a gathering stand of a bunch of my friends from all over the country. People I've known for years that you've, that, you know, and, and others that I've just gotten to know through my dying out loud work in the last couple of years. And we all gathered in the Gulf, Gulf shores, uh, on a, on a, on the beach and spent a week at this big house. And one of my uh, followers from, from Maine um, came and she, a transgender woman, and she was a little reticent to come into a house full of strangers as a transgender woman and not know any of them. And, you know, it takes a lot of courage to do that. And, and she mustered the courage and did it. She she told me beforehand that she said, I've never, she said, I made a promise to myself, years ago to, to not do something because I was afraid because every time I pushed through the fear and did it, I was always glad I did. And she was amazing. Everyone loved her. She was a crack up. She could have been a stand up comedian. One of the best things about her story I love is that and I wish she were here and she'd chat in with us, but because she tells her story in this very um, 
open about everything. But but um, she came out. She says, you know, people ask her, how many closets do you have? Because nine years ago she came out as as gay, and then a few years later came out as trans. And um, her her ex ex I mean, let me get it right here because her ex wife is saying like, you know, you're going to make me look stupid. You keep coming out of these closets, and and so she a few years ago her ex wife and her ex wife's husband invited her to move in with them and they all live together and she says samantha says my ex wife is my best friend and i just love that kind of acceptance and love and generosity and it's just beautiful when people can open their minds and put aside these prehistoric ideas of gender and sexuality and humanity and just accept us for who we are. And I just, I just, it warmed my heart so much to be a part and to be uh, included in that story. And so what you're doing, Stan, is helping people come to those places. And I just fucking applaud it. Thank um, yeah, prehistoric ideas and all. Well, no, I mean, I'm, I'm including religion in that, but these ideas about people not supporting each other in their identity and you know their what, sexuality. So, so much of the sexuality thing is projection. Uh, you know, it, if you use like the, the Jewish tradition as a wisdom tradition, as opposed to the Bible being some authoritative constitutional word of God. I mean, you think about that garden story that we always talked about. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve and the fruit and everything, they were naked and not ashamed. Doesn't say they were naked and not sinful. They were naked and not ashamed. The pristine soul wasn't the one that avoided sin. That wasn't even the issue. The pristine soul was the one that was able to be naked and not ashamed. There was no sense of not enoughness or insufficiency. And then she sees this fruit with her eye, picks it with her hand, eats it with her mouth, digests it with her belly, Yet when the shame localizes, what's she cover? Her genitals. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, the wisdom tradition is just showing we carry shame in our psyches. This sense of insufficiency, that's what I call shame. Just a sense of not enoughness we carry in our psyches. It manifests in our bodies. And it particularly manifests in those parts of our bodies that physiologically and psychologically have more nerve endings per square millimeter. And it's our sexuality. It's just where the runoff goes. And she covered her, She hadn't even sinned sexually in the story. But it just kind of felt uncomfortable there. And those fig leaves that we all carry for our sexuality, for our bodies, one of the easiest, most sophomoreish things to do psychologically is just find a minority group to project your own insecurities on and scapegoat. That's all, that's all we're doing it, because in all of our, in every human minds, the most righteous of preachers, God only knows the full expanse of where we've gone in our minds, with our bodies, with our sensuality, with our sexuality. We can't admit that to ourselves. So we find these minority groups to project all of that angst on and, and homosexual people, bisexual people, pansexual people, these are just a scapegoated group of people for all of that angst. It's so, it's like, it's just, it takes a freshman psychology course to put some of that together and admit. Mm -hmm. uh, what, um, um, one of the narratives that I'm sure you've heard, Stan, is um, in going back to the, to these gay and trans people who take their lives. One of the narratives that I know I've heard uh, Christian Jews is that well see they were so messed up in their own selves that they they were so mentally unstable that they took their lives how, how do you how do you respond to people like that other than hit them square in the face which is what I would try to do but how do you deal with that particular narrative I hear it almost every day because one of the one of the big one of the big things that we're pointing to right now are, are statistics coming out of places like the Trevor Project. You know, the Trevor Trevor Project. It, it's very clear. Really good studies are showing. Think about it. LGBTQ kids are attempting suicide. Depending on the study, 
LGBTQ kids who are raised in rejecting homes. And that doesn't mean they're kicked out of the house. It means their parents, their authority figures, their rabbi, their priest, their minister is saying to them, you are displeasing to God. They're rejecting them on a moral fundamental level of their essential self. Those children are six to eight times as likely to attempt to make an attempt on their life and suicide, not of heterosexual cisgender kids, of other queer kids who are raised in accepting homes. Hmm. Six to eight times more likely. And you want to hear something really stunning? Their attempts are five to six times as likely to land them in the hospital or the graveyard. In other words, when they do it, they really do it. They really mean it. Yeah. yeah. So when I, when you throw those statistics out, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking about 11 year old and 16 year old and 14 year old and 18 year old kids. I, I'm talking about adolescent children. These numbers, um, these numbers are, are applying to. So the response that I get is, and, and most of the time people try to be sympathetic with a head tilted. This is a day where you would hit them right in the throat, but they say, well, but that's what sin does in the life of a person. Yep. Yeah. I know it's galling. And at that point, you want to know my approach here? Honestly, here's my approach because it doesn't help hitting them in the throat. My approach is, all right, I'm not an imbecile. I do know the difference between coincidence, correlation, and cause and effect. And I am not demanding right now that you believe the church's failure on this is cause and effect for these children's suicide. I'm asking you not to demand that I believe it's cause and effect sin in their life. We're both willing to admit that this is not strictly coincidental. But do not the lives of these children merit at least an exploration, a re-exploration of what the correlation is? Because it's not coincidental. These kids' levels of depression, these kids' levels of suicide, homelessness, drug abuse are high. Human suffering morally demands that the correlation be revisited. Would you be willing at least to revisit while these kids, the numbers are still proliferating? Mm -hmm. And when somebody looks at me and says, no, I, it's, it's already clear what that correlation is, I honestly... I do dust my feet off. I don't, I don't, it's not that I'm giving up on them as a human being, but I have nothing left to offer them if they're not willing based on human history and based on Christian history, we've been wrong so many times. It's a part of our history. How oh, yeah. can you not carry a measure of humility in, at, at the center of your hermeneutic or your interpretive lens? How can you not have some sense, knowing our own history of humility to say we've been wrong before and there's too many kids dying? And, and you know what? The other reality is sin in their life. Let me tell you the story, and I can tell them right now. Let me tell you the story of about 50 kids between the age of 11 and 14 who could be either attempted their life, attempted on their life, or taken their life. Let me tell you 50 stories right now of parents and grandparents who say there was nothing about that child's life that indicated they were sinful. They were the sweetest, kindest, smartest, most Christian of all of our children. I have heard that so many times. That's what gives them pause. They're like, if this is sin in their life, how is this our one kid that's sitting on the front row? How's this our kid that's nice to all the old people? We're, mm -hmm. we're they're, they're prepubescent. It hasn't even played out sexually yet. They haven't even masturbated the first time. Where is this playing out sexually? This is who they are. It's the color of their eyes. I have enough mm -hmm. of those testimonies that you can't look at me and say this is not worthy of re-exploration. That's immoral. Well, at that point, you're dealing with a person who just can't hear. They don't have ears to hear. Genevieve, you had something yeah. to go ahead. Well, my, what, what angers me and what frustrates me so much is that 
it's it's not even like you have to do an extensive study in the situation. You can just ask these people. You can just ask trans and queer people who are struggling, why are they struggling? And it's not because they don't love themselves and the way they present. It has everything to do with not being accepted and not being supported. Mm -hmm. It's it's not rocket science. And so I get, I, I have a lot of, of empathy, just as you said earlier, Stan, um, for people who are caught up in this evangelical world because mo for most of them, they haven't thought about it and they're brainwashed and they, they aren't doing this out of malice. They genuinely think they're saving the world. But it is so sickening. It is so sickening that the answer to their questions is staring them in, like right in their face. And I don't know if it's a combination of just being on their high horse and, and believing that they know everything and that everybody else is wrong or they just can't grapple with the horrible realization that it's their fault. A lot of times it's their fault, which in fact, there was a question that came on earlier that I want to get to um, from Cosmic Kyle. Um, what is it about evangelical specifically that makes it difficult to accept people for who they are? Why is not personal happiness of people more important than a belief I can't understand? Thank you. I should just put it up there. Um, prefacing my response to that question, we do need to remember when you look at North Korea, Cuba, Russia, China, homophobia, transphobia does not have a sole root in religious thinking. There are a lot of countries in this world, a lot of cultures in this world that are not religiously driven that are still in the dark ages on transphobia. So I think the roots of this are even deeper than religion. Religion gives people a good excuse to act on a root that's even deeper in the human psyche um, than religion. Uh, in, in terms of the evangelical, I mean, the question about evangelicalism, evangelicalism assumes, and Dave, you can echo this, we assumed, I mean, it was constitutionally assumed that the Bible was the direct word of God. It was the final and ultimate authority. Yeah. And what that book says goes. I mean, mm -hmm. it, we don't live in the God belt. We don't even live in the Jesus belt. We live in the Bible belt. You go on. I did a study of evangelical churches about 10 years ago. 80% of the evangelical churches, I looked at over 200 large evangelical churches, over 80% of those evangelical churches, in their statement of fundamental beliefs, the Bible was the first tenet. Not God, not Jesus. It was, we believe the Bible. I mean, the first, yeah, it, 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 pre, it precedes God in terms of just that assumption. It's like I told my dad one time, dad's like, I said, well, dad, how do you know that's the word of God? He said, well, and he started quoting scripture. I'm like, well, that's the Bible saying it's the word of God. I said, that'd be, that'd be like me saying, hey, I need to tell you something really important. I'm the smartest man in the world. And you know why you should believe that? Because the smartest man in the world just told you. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's the Bible's logic. Yeah, but yeah. it's like plugging into itself. So, but, but that is the belief, Dave, and that's where people are stuck. They, the Bible... I think I think the biggest the biggest issue and I know this is arguable the biggest issue the biggest problem for conservative Christian people is their belief about the Bible if I could ever Dave you know at Grace Point I spent 10 years before we got on specific issues like the LGBTQ issue I spent 10 years trying to soften people's grip on the Bible yeah like yeah. to literally undermine their sense that the Bible was this end all be all Mind and you, yeah, and you basically at the end um, was pretty much reduced to looking at the Bibles as allegorical stories and trying to uh, pick something from from it that you could uh, weave a good sermon about. It wasn't like the Word of God in any sense. And but but for me, for me that was that was when it all fell apart for me personally. Is when I realized the Bible was just a man made document. I, I, I know you and I have had that conversation hundred and I told I think you were one of the first people I said it to. I don't believe the Bible is the word of God. The Bible is obviously not the word of God if there is a God. The Bible 
at most is the spiritual travel diary of our religious ancestors. It brings us into good conversations about good subjects. It provokes good questions. It doesn't give us final answers and propositional truth about these things. It just doesn't. And when evangelical people say, well, where do you come off saying that? I'm like, from you, because you do that selectively with all kinds of issues in the Bible. You pick and choose. I mean, if, if they use the hermeneutic on LGBTQ people that they use on a hundred other subjects in the Bible, just get consistent with it. Mm. It's the spiritual travel diary of our religious ancestors wrestling with existential questions. And to yeah. that, it's a wonderful book. But if you take it beyond that, it becomes. Um, it, it weaponizes it. It, it weaponizes becomes a weapon. It. Yeah. And it hurts people. Um, Genevieve, uh, before we, we do want to close out here in a little bit, we're going to close in a different way tonight. Um, and there's a, a GoFundMe for Milo, and that is for what specifically? Yes, and it's uh, in the show notes at the bottom, right? Yeah, 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 it should be in the show notes. Yes, there is a memorial GoFundMe going on right now, um, in Milo's honor. Um, they want to reach raise fifteen thousand dollars for a local organization in Lincoln, Nebraska, where Milo had fought. Um, it supports trans and non binary people in the community and activists and will be very instrumental in helping them organize and get ready for this vote in November uh, to pass a fairness ordinance um, in their community. Uh, they're fighting a really hard fight. So please, uh, if you can go and donate to the GoFundMe. Mm -hmm. And um, I see a question in the chat there. Is Stan coming to the beach next week, next year? Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that, Stan. I think maybe you should. <laughs> You're muted. Oh, you muted. You do a, is it a nudist beach? Is that? No. Well, no. Uh, no. Funny, you, funny you should, no. Funny you should no. ask that. No. Funny you should ask that. <laughs> funny you should ask that because the last night this year, we, we had a heated pool at the house. And the last night, a bunch of us went skinny dipping. So. Maybe it is nudist, but you know what? We're free. We're 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 no no body shaming there. Naked and not ashamed. Take the fig leaf. Right. Mm -hmm. The link is also in the description. Um, yeah. So the um, <laughs> the um, go find me for, in Milo's uh, honor and memorial. And uh, as you said, Stan, Milo's one of many, way too many that are are paying the price for just simply trying to be themselves and. I just am so angry that um, that this country and fundamentalists, whether it's religious fundamentalist or secular fundamentalist, the idea is fundamentalism. And I think you said it well, there are cultures that are not inherently religious, but there's a fundamentalist ideology that demands people think a certain way. That's what fundamentalism is. You have to think and believe and behave this way. And anything outside of these lines, we're going to judge you for. And that has to go. That has to go. It's killing people. Stan, final thoughts before we sign out? Yeah, I, I, I don't, you know, I don't know. I don't know too much these days. Um, I really don't, I don't, in terms of the God thing, Dave, I don't believe, you know, I, I, again, I slide from one to 99 on that. Even hopes, you know, it's beyond hope for me. Sometimes it just lands in the place of dreams. I still dream about a world of beauty and goodness. And whether you're on the atheistic side of that or the theistic side of that, the, the dream of a world of mutuality and love and gratitude and curiosity is, is something that the queer people I work with, they don't, they don't have in the religious sector, especially, they don't have a dream, they have a nightmare. And, yeah. and I, I work in the middle of nightmares. And to the extent that religion is a part of that, that is deeply grievous to me. I just continue to work with some measure of patience, remembering my own story. And mm -hmm. um, yeah, if I can relieve a little suffering and bring a little joy to these folk like Milo, it's amazing what's happening in the lives of these children, these young people. I, I honestly, it's religious terrorism. 
you literally are flying a psychological plane right through the trade center of their soul. I, I don't know what else it could be called than terrorism to terrorize a child. And it's not even terrorizing them over the color of their eyes. It's terrorizing on them on this fundamental part of how they love their identity. Yes. It's not just the co- the color of their eyes. It's they're we're taking this beautiful part of the way they could love and have a soulmate and connect with another human being and calling that inherently flawed. That is a mind fuck of all mind fucks that is taking if there is a God that's taking that God's name in vain. And I'm working as hard as I can to undo that nightmare. Well, I applaud that Genevieve. Um, I don't I know you don't know Stan um, and I've known him. You a long time, bro, and um, I know that you're a good human. You're doing everything you can to try to make the the one world we know we have better for all humans. Um, and I, I, you know, uh, you know, I, I think that rather than God being a, the warm fuzzy that we want to make life better, I'm I'm thinking it's us and our our humanity that we link arms and do that. And Stan, you're doing it, brother. And um, I love you for it. You're muted. I wish y'all quit muting me. If Am I gone now? No, you're, 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 you're here. You're back. You just said, I just want to say, what that spiel you just gave, if there is a God, she just said, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing would be more pleasing to that God than just my God. I mean, even Jesus, you know, in Matthew 25, the thing you used to talk about all the time, Dave, all he says is well done. He doesn't say well believed, well worshiped, well raised. He says, well done. You did good. You did, you did good, boy. And I'm glad you're home. And here's the words I live by. And I know you're doing the same, Stan, because I know you came from a similar background. And Maya Angelou said it best. Do the best you can do until you know better. And then when you yeah. know better, do better. And that's just what we're trying to do here. And we're learning. We're growing. I love how you said, I don't know many things. I, I feel the same way. I don't know much. And I, I, I want to be open and, and learning and curious till my last breath. I want to go out saying, wow, I didn't know that. That was great to learn. And then the lights go out. <laughs> I can't think of a better way. So um, tonight um, we're going to end a little different and we're going to just close this out. I want I want us to have a moment of silence for Milo and all the others. And then Correa, after a minute, you play the dedication and that will be our show for tonight.